I ended up in Hamas without knowing I was in Hamas. Those forces are so deeply despised by Jeremy Corbyn and those on the left of Jeremy Corbyn that they are prepared to make common cause with the Islamist far right. In my eyes, the Prophet Muhammad is a feminist for having done all of that. You, you'll have to correct me if I've got this wrong, but he, he married a, a six-year-old. No, it's not right. But I know in my heart of hearts that I would not love Jesus or have a soft spot for my Jewish cousins had it not been for the Arabian Prophet Muhammad. The Islamists won't accept that loyalty to the nation state. They want to recreate some kind of entity, caliphate, call it whatever they want. Therefore, uh, that collectivism, a situation in Gaza, means Muslims in Britain must respond to Gaza because we won't respond to the Uyghurs, we won't respond to the Syrians, we won't respond to the Sudanese, we won't respond to the Somalians, or indeed the Kashmiris, but somehow Gaza is more important because Gaza is warped in faith, and faith that's politicized. When I watch the protests in London, or indeed here in Washington DC, the thing that strikes me most, not a single British flag or an American flag, is at those so-called pro-Palestinian protests. Hello and welcome to the Winston Marshall Show with me, Winston Marshall. I had the pleasure of sitting down with Ed Hussein. Ed is author of several books, including The Islamist, Among the Mosques, and The House of Islam. I've been reading him for many, many years. Just to meet him was really a dream come true. We discussed, amongst many other things, the geopolitics of the world in the post-Abraham Accords world. We discussed Islam in Britain, Muslims and Christians and Jews, and all Britons living peacefully together. We discussed the history of Islamism specifically from Saeed Qutba moving forward and much, much else. I was thrilled to speak with him. I love this conversation and I'm sure you're going to love it just as much as I did. Before you listen, I ask if you want to support this show, all you have to do is press the subscribe button. If you press the subscribe button, I can bring on more great guests like Ed Hussein. We can discuss the important issues that you want to hear about. So please press the subscribe button. Many thanks for listening and without further ado, Ed Hussein. Thank you for watching the Winston Marshall Show. Ed, Ed Hussein, it's wonderful to finally meet you. I've been reading your books for and, and writings for many, many years and uh, following your work with Quilliam and beyond and de-radicalization. So it's actually, a, I consider it a great honor to meet you. Thank you for taking the, the time to sit with me. The privilege is mine, Winston. Thank you for coming out all the way to Washington, DC. Thank you. Let's, let's get into it. You've had a really remarkable life, but I understand that in your early Islamist days, you were affiliated with Hamas. And I bring that up because obviously, as we speak, we're five months into the Israel-Hamas conflict. And who better to have insight, I've wondered, than, than you to know the workings about Hamas. So I wondered, uh, uh, well, firstly, I guess, about your experience with Hamas. I wasn't expecting that question, so well done for uh, a hard question to start with, so let's do it. I just, I, I, I'd just like to start by saying the following, that um, you know, your listeners, your viewers, and the wider audience out there, uh, listen to what's going to be said, because too often we, we, you know, we, we flick through channels and we don't listen. And I want to begin by just remembering Viktor Frankl, who was a survivor of the Holocaust, the founder of a school of psychology, a philosopher, and um, one night at midnight, he got a phone call from a lady who was about to take her life, and she said, you survived the concentration camps. Tell me why I should live. And so he went through many reasons, uh, and then she hung up on him. Several months later, he met her, and he now wanted to understand which of his arguments was most successful in stopping her from committing suicide. And he asked, was it this argument? Was it that argument? And she said, no, it was none of those arguments. So he asked her, why are you still here? She said, because in the middle of the night, someone was prepared to listen to me. And it was the power of you just listening that made me think the world is somewhere worth spending more time in, that's why I'm here. So Viktor Frank Frankl's approach is something that we should bear in mind. And I think the power of Hamas for my generation, I was in my late teens, early 20s, and the whole generation now is that it is listening 
to what ordinary Palestinians in their case want. Yes, it exploits the grievances and it exploits the needs of Palestinians for dignity, for freedom, for recognition, for their own land and for their own state. So why did someone like me who was 21 years old on my way out from Hezbollah Tahrir land myself in Hamas? And that's why I ask people to listen. I ask my you know, Muslim friends in the UK in particular and elsewhere just to listen to this, is that I ended up in Hamas without knowing I was in Hamas. I joined something called the Islamic Society of Britain, which still functions today. And they said to me, come to a halaqa, which is an evening gathering. And I went and there was a lovely man and his Palestinian wife and three boys who made uh, meals for us on a Thursday night, warm Palestinian food. And we just went because this particular gentleman and his home were so uh, friendly to us and were opening their hearts and homes and hospitality and listening to our concerns as young Muslims in Britain. And before I know it, he's commenting on the Quran. He's using Sayyid Qutb, which he, who is kind of um, uh, Lenin, if you like, of global Islamism. And he is fundraising in his home for Hamas and is condemning the state of Israel and Jewish people globally. And it, it wasn't that we signed up for Hamas, we just found ourselves there. Um, and that's what's going on with hundreds of thousands of young Muslims across the West. We just find ourselves in these protests, find ourselves in these organizations because there's good intent. The intent is to join an Islamic organization. And before you know it, you're part of some global network of uh, terrorists and those financing terrorism committed to the destruction of the state of Israel. And I go back to that point of listening because that gentleman in his home listened to us. And I think it, on our side, we didn't listen in the end because we decided his message was wrong. And I, I just want to end this answer by, answer by saying the same thing, that, that the people of Israel, um, uh, going back to the time of Jacob onwards, used a prayer called the Shema, you know, hero Israel, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a frequent prayer. And in our tradition, in the Islamic tradition, you know, our founding father, Ismail, his name comes from Yasma, to hear, to listen. And that's why I, I just think throughout the rest of this podcast, I'm sure we'll be having similarly difficult questions asked. And it's just, you know, in that Viktor Frankl, Ismail, Shema spirit, I think it's important to listen rather than be so judgmental so early on and then uh, form your opinions at the end of our end of our dialogue today. That's absolutely the case. And, and any listeners who aren't already familiar with your work, you have dedicated two decades to tackling radicals and uh, de and you've been committed to de-radicalization uh, in our country in Britain and I, I believe even in America and not to mention your other work that I hope we can discuss on the, on the geopolitical scale uh, which is very interesting so I, I hope we can get into that but um, uh, but I should also interrupt you by saying the following that I, I I believe firmly in God and I'm proud of my faith tradition proud of being a Muslim and I think one of the reasons why we're able to have this conversation is because I did time as it were in Hamas and in Hezbo Tahrir and and in other organizations that are now kind of prime in the British and wider European media space um, and on, on, on your question, Winston, sorry about Hamas, it's also worth noting that Hamas has a terrorist arm. Um, and I think the debate is too often, well, 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 it also has a political arm, it has a welfare arm, it has an educational arm. But what we, what we miss and what, what I saw when I was with them for a period of about a year, you know, mostly fundraising, mostly attending events, mostly recruiting other people to the organization um, and studying their material and thereby being connected to them when I visited the Middle East, especially in Beirut, um, what, what you see with them is that they have a, a global network. And what that network offers is a sense of belonging. So they, they, they listened and they gave a sense of belonging. What transpired, um, you know, this was before the Hamas winning the election. I was there with them in you know, 2002, 2000, 2003. But it's just worth us noting, noting the following is that we on the other side, who oppose Hamas, oppose extremism, oppose the 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 the, 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 the hatred and the anti-Semitism that Hamas advocates. We also need to have that sense of listening, belonging, recognizing. And when people, especially in countries such as Germany, France, where there is a real lack of young Muslims feeling that sense of belonging, that they, I think it's incumbent on our side to make sure that people feel that sense of home, um, that they are 
to children off that soil and they're not going anywhere that they belong there. And obviously with that uh, entitlement, they also have obligations, something we can get into the rest of the interview, but I thought I should. You talk about this and I just spoke to Ian Hirsi Ali in a recent uh, interview um, podcast uh, for this podcast and she described how the effect of the mosques in Britain has been that there was a lot of young Muslims who were a bit lost, didn't feel like they could integrate or they were lost in Britain. And so they may be causing trouble on the, the streets and the mosques took them in and which I thought so far so good. You know, that's good that that faith and religions and that, you know, that's kind of one of their obligations is to create community and bring people in. So um, I can see that the first part is youthful people who are lost being taken in by elders is is a good thing i think in principle yes if i can just understand this a bit better you're describing what happened that was in britain right yes so presumably hamas in britain is very different to hamas in gaza yes and no um yes they're different because they're not governing thank god yes in britain because they don't have control uh of territory and they don't have access to weapons on the scale that the Iranian government is uh, providing for Hamas in Gaza. Um, and yes, in the sense that they're not in combat with the government next door uh, and trying to destroy a country next door, which is Israel. But no, they're not different in the UK in the sense that they still use the same educational materials. So we were exposed to studying of Sayyid Qutb's commentary in the Quran, rather than, than a thousand other much more thoughtful, spiritually erudite commentators, you know, Al-Tabari comes to mind, Al-Qurtubi comes to mind. Uh, none of those, uh, Ibn Rushd, Imam Ghazal, none of those were used. We were, we were forced to study, you know, the Lenin of uh, a radical religiosity of the last century. So that's, that's similar. And uh, much like Hamas in uh, Gaza, in the UK, Hamas operatives and Hamas affiliated organizations. They don't call themselves Hamas, by the way. They give themselves several front organizations. I don't want to name them because they won't get into libel. And that's another way they keep people like us quiet by kind of throwing libel. Um, Which, so what do you mean by people like us? Well, those of us who are critical of those who wish to use our faith for political purposes. Um, you know, those of us who are normal mainstream Muslims who believe in the tradition of our forefathers um, and believe in an Islam of peace, mercy, compassion. You know, the, the, the Prophet Muhammad is described as uh, Rahmatan lil alameen in the Quran. His, his most important trait is he has compassion. And I say this for a reason, and I will get back to Hamas. I say this for a reason that those of us who think that somehow Marxism uh, came out of nowhere and thin air and is and we from the enlightenment tradition have nothing to do with it are wrong because Karl Marx starts his ideology by making the fundamental break with Hegel while Hegel is focused on the movement of the spirit in history i.e. the Holy Spirit moves history uh, but, which means God um, what you have here is uh, uh, Marx saying no there's no such thing as spirit it's all material so from that perversion of the enlightenment from Hegel we go to Karl Marx and the mass killings, 110 million people kin, killed under the Soviet Union. Uh, there's a direct correlation, there's a direct line here. Similarly with Islamists, not Islam and not ordinary Muslims, Islamists who are, are perverting our faith tradition, they have a similar break. And for me, the Prophet Muhammad's description as alamin, the mercy unto humanity or the world, is broken by Sayyid Qutb because he, he cuts away the compassion, the mercy, and he then focuses on, on, on killing government, power, subjugation of non-Muslims, destruction of the state of Israel. He has a whole book called, you know, Ma'arakatuna Ma Ma you know, our battles with the Jews or our battle with the Jews. Where does all that come from? That's the kind of Leninist style, Marxist style break with the enlightenment in the Western tradition. And in our faith-based Islamic tradition, it's cutting our roots from the prophetic heritage. That's why I say people like us, those who are connected to the Prophet and uh, and the Quranic uh, lineage. So so Hamas forced us you know, to go into fundraising campaigns, recruitment campaigns, and to organize mass events, but they were organized under various other names, you know, Muslim Council of this, Muslim Association of that, Islamic Society of this, you know, Muslim Welfare this, you know, they, they gave themselves multiple names, but we knew that ultimately the funds went back to a a charity which is now banned 
and it went into uh, Gaza and it went into supporting what were called martyrs. Looking back, it's what we call um, uh, suicide bombers. So I, I, I disclose all this not to kind of um, play hero. And I don't like talking about it. I really don't. That's why I was surprised by your question. But I talk about it because it's important that this confession, this openness, helps a young generation realize that because you're in a protest with some guy in central London who's calling for the destruction of Israel, your intent, your intent might be noble. Um, but you're mixing with a crowd that will take you on a detour to jihadism, yeah. to anti-Semitism, to destruction, to hatred of your own country, further isolation. And then you come back 10 years, 12 years, that Shamima Begum, and wonder where did we go wrong? Well, you're going wrong at the very moment. And that's what happened to thousands of us. And it's just, you know, uh, yes, it was our political awakening. You know, people like Peter Mandelson spent their days as communists, and then they matured into becoming what well, they've become now. So a, a whole generation went through this, i.e. my generation in, in the West. And I think it's just right for us to say to a younger teen and 20, uh, 20s generation that, you know, be careful uh, as to where you end up on a Thursday, Friday, Saturday night in the name of liberating Palestine. Well, obviously Hamas are prescribed in the, in the UK. His book, Tereo, as you've mentioned, were only prescribed in January of this year by Home Secretary James Cleverly. So, they, and, and you'll remember after October 7th, and, and since October 7th, we've had weekly marches through London, our city, and they included his butchery, in fact, only until recently, where have they not been published. So what you're describing is that they're quite literally, these Islamist groups are rubbing shoulders with maybe what you would say the normal mainstream Muslims who are sympathetic to the Palestinians. I, I wondered if you had insight into what's specifically in the post October seventh marches, what's going on in London in these in these in these groups? I mean, I look at what's going on in London, and um, I, I lament. I lament for the reason that, um, that, that there's a propensity in us humans not to remember. You know, in Arabic, the word insan comes from nisyan, forgetfulness. It's our natural state that we forget. So to see, you know, on a global level. The global left side by side with global Islamism, you know, by which I mean, you know, here China and then the Iranian government um, forming an alliance against the West. That's at a global level. And then at the local level, in something uh, like the protests in London and in other cities, but especially in London, we've got the reenactment of what happened in the 70s and the 90s happening again now. In the 70s, you had Michel Foucault, the famous. Uh, kind of philosopher, postmodernist from France, making common cause with the Iranian Ayatollahs. And he was supportive of the Iranian revolution, um, only to discover that the left-leaning left secularists in Iran were then killed, massacred, placed into exile. Um, and, and similarly, in the, in the 90s, we, we had an alliance between the global left and the local left in England. During the Iraq war, we saw that play out again, opposition to the Iraq war. Again, I mean, opposition is entirely people's choice in a free country. But when the Muslim Association of Britain aligned itself with the Socialist Workers' Party, uh, you know, it was, again, a strange alliance. In, you know, in, in 2005, we saw Gaza, you know, Hamas aligned, being aligned with the global left and the local left in England, only to see, you know, leftists and secularists being thrown off the, 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 the tall buildings of Gaza and, and, and completely decimated by by Hamas. And we're seeing the same movie reenacting again. In, in, and the movie is this, that there's so much hatred for what the West and its Muslim allies stand for. And I don't see a clash of civilizations and I don't see, you know, our allies in Arab countries being our enemies. I see, you know, we have, you know, the US, the UK, Europe, and our allies, particularly in the Gulf, um, who are opposed to Hamas, opposed to the Muslim Brotherhood, opposed to the Iranian regime's form of Islamism. Um, those forces are so deeply despised by Jeremy Corbyn and those on the left of Jeremy Corbyn that they're prepared to make common cause with the Islamist far right because their hatred for us is so strong. You know? mm -hmm. And that's what's playing out, that we hate America, we hate Britain, we hate Israel and their allies to the extent that we will make common cause with our ideological enemies for now. 
Um, very few people have thought this through. Michel Foucault had thought it through. Um, but then, uh, you know, he, he lived to regret his alliance with the Iranian uh, uh, regime. He, regret he, li he lived to regret it. But it's not publicized because I think there are three in instances that he did visit. And then he, he was critical of their persecution of the left. But the point is, a, a new generation of postmodernists and progressives are again making common cause with the Islamist far right without realizing that every tenet of the left, whether it's the far left, you know, atheism, whether it's a support for homosexuality, you know, pansexuality, you know, uh, you name every tenet of the left, you know, even, you know, um, uh, the, the belief of, of the left in kind of common uh, uh, ownership, in other words, removing private property, all of that is opposed by the Islamist right. So what unites them other than their mutual hatred for a world order? It's quite interesting. Is that one thing that I'm hearing you say that is new to me is that I thought they had been united in their hatred for Jews. And actually, it's, it's, it's wider than that. It's a hatred for Western civilization. It's a hatred for Western civilization. Um, it's also a hatred for Muslim civilization. Um, I, I say that because I say the Qutub's works and the writings of every one of these Islamist luminaries, and again, I distinguish between ordinary Islam-loving, faithful Muslims uh, of a 1,400-year tradition and people like Sayyid Qutb, who are journalists, Egyptian agitators from the last century. In their works, they don't reference the great Muslim mystics, you know, whether it's uh, the Muslim philosophers or the Muslim Sufis. So, you know, um, Al-Kindi, Al-Farabi, Ibn Sina, uh, Ibn Rushd, um, all the way down to the great mystics of our time are ignored by the Islamists because the mystics call for love, compassion, kindness, coexistence. Um, and that's a problem for them. So you don't see or hear from the Islamists any veneration of the great Islamic civilizations because they're anti-Muslim civilization, because the average Muslim loathes Islamists for the reason that we're seeing in Gaza now, that they bring catastrophe on us before they bring catastrophe on themselves. We are the hostages that they use in their battles. And the average Muslim, again and again, whether it's in Pakistan or Iraq or elsewhere, has been on the receiving end of the ire of other governments against Islamists. And that's why, I mean, four years ago, we wouldn't be able to say this, but now we can, that even in Saudi Arabia, you know, the home of Mecca and Medina, the Muslim Brotherhood is banned, Hamas is banned. In Egypt, they're banned. In the UAE, they're banned. Mm. But in Yemen, in Kuwait, uh, and in other countries, Morocco, Jordan, you know, they function. So it's a mixed picture. Therefore, I think we're at a at a, a at a crucial point as to what do we do with the Muslim Brotherhood in Britain because they bring harm to Muslims, and that's why Muslim governments ban them. And they despise ordinary Muslims, just like um, you know Jeremy Corbyn and others have a dislike towards anyone who's working class but aspires towards being middle class or upper class because they lose that vote, and they lose that you know victim uh, support block. Islamists similarly dislike ordinary Muslims that oppose them because we are seen to be uh, you know their enemies, their opponents, but also removing. The, the carpet from or, you know under their feet because they stand on the on the ground of faith and you know we we reject them on faith grounds you know that's that's the power of it that we reject them on scriptural grounds that what they want stands against Sharia against usul al fiqh or the or the principles of jurisprudence and against the teachings of one thousand four hundred years of Muslim tradition and most importantly against global Muslim consensus against the ijma of one thousand 1.8 billion Muslims who reject the Islamist project of creating a single caliphate and destroying 52 nation states and uniting, you know, however hundreds of cultures and languages and histories in one uh, fascist expansionist dictatorship that wants to retake India, retake Rome, you know, conquer parts of Spain, reconquer parts of Italy, and come as far as France because they think wherever their armies previously uh, trod, not their armies incidentally, those were imperial days, they need to reclaim. So it's a, it's, I mean, if anyone went around saying we want to re, 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 uh, create the British Empire or the French Empire, people would pour scorn on them. Yeah. 
But somehow when it's done by Islamists, we're all supposed to be silent. But I think some of us, you know, will not be bullied or intimidated by them. There's a few things going on here. There's a geopolitical angle, which I know you're much involved in, and, and that, I'd like to get that in later. There's obviously the, what's going on in Britain, which I want more clarity on. But just just to help on maybe basic terms, so you say there's 1.8 billion normal average, I think you'd call them mainstream Muslims earlier in this conversation, who are opposed to Islamists, but aren't there 1.8 billion Muslims? And so I, I, I don't quite no. I've asked this to a few people. It's not clear to me who are the average mainstream Muslims are and who are the Islamists. And for example, in British media, we're constantly getting people I consider pretty extreme from the Muslim community speaking up, people like Mohammed Hijab or Dili Hussein, um, whereas we're not getting the moderate Muslim voice, particularly in Britain. But then, you know, it, is it what the difference between a mainstream Muslim in the Emiratis is completely different to one in uh, Morocco, is completely different to one in Qatar. There's so many different Islams and, and Muslims that it, when you say the average mainstream Muslim, I'm not sure I understand what you mean. I, I'll define the, the, the difference, but you know, you, you're know, you referencing you know, individuals. I, I don't know. Uh, one of my teachers is Shah Abdullah bin Bayya, and he was here recently in Washington, D.C., and we had a beautiful conversation with him. One of the things he said that, uh, you know, that we don't discuss individuals, but yeah. we discuss virtues. And I thought that was a that, that was reflection of mainstream Islam. Right there you had someone who's the Mufti of the United Arab Emirates, who was the vice president of Mauritania, who's memorized uh, thousands of sayings of the prophets, thousands of bits of poetry, you know, thousands of verses of the Quran rooted in tradition. And he is the definition of mainstream Islam. Shah Abdullah bin Bayya is renowned across the Muslim world. So what 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 is he that what is it that defines him? What defines him is the fact that he does not see Islam as a political project. Islamists see Islam as a domineering political project. Mainstream Muslims around the world recognize that we now have 52 nation states wanting more. We want Kashmir as, as a nation state. We want a nation state for the Uyghurs. We want a nation state for the Palestinians. We want some kind of nation state for the Kurds. So it's not that Muslims have a, you know, uh, a propensity towards a global empire. On the contrary, you know, we want more nation states. Islamists oppose nation states. They want to create um, uh, their own form of political power in, in one country and then conquer others or create an alliance of others and remove existing governments which is not what the average Muslim wants. It's, I think the best analogy is that trade unions, you know, most workers probably join a trade union, but they don't go around agitating for it. It's a certain breed of communist influenced global agitator that makes you know, trade union activism mm -hmm. their most central activity. So, so it is with Islamists. You know, maybe uh, you know, some people want to see some kind of, uh, in Hamas, controlled Gaza, dignity for Arabs and Muslims. So they vote for Hamas, but it doesn't then follow. They want to, you know, destroy 52 nation states, that they want to recreate a global caliphate, that, you know, they, they, they want to um, uh, demean women's rights, that they want to punish homosexuals, that they want to uh, expand into other countries. And that's the Islamist project. Um, and I think finally, what's the difference? difference between an Islamist and an ordinary Muslim is it is this ordinary Muslims have multiple approaches to Sharia by definition because you know the Quran again and again says in you know, mustaqim that we guided you to a straight path and we don't have the fanaticism of the capital T truth and if you don't believe in my salvation you go to hell that was never the Muslim way you know subul we talked about multiple paths in the Quran so that's the average mainstream Muslim rooted in the Quran where they have, you know, a, a, an inherent pluralism. That was our way, you know, for 1,400 years. What does the Sharia believe in? You know, the Sharia is about the protection of life, protection of property, conserving of uh, the intellect, worship, and most importantly, security to provide for all those four things. 
That's called the maqasid of the sharia. That's the way of bin Bayya and the mainstream Muslims, even in Saudi Arabia today. How is the Islamist different? Well, they have one interpretation of sharia, which is to chop off people's arms if you're a thief, to stone adulterers, to uh, denigrate women to a second-class citizen of you can't divorce, you can't inherit, inherit less, or you don't have custody unless sharia courts, which operate in England, by the way, impose that on you. So those are the, the kind of issues that demarcate ordinary uh, love-based, uh, nation-focused citizen, uh, uh, citizens of secular states, Muslims, versus Islamists who have an entirely different worldview and trying to force firstly Muslims and then non-Muslims into their straitjacket of you will go back to an imagined past that we have interpreted and we will execute on you. Maybe we can it's so hard to talk about a whole the whole you know 1.8 billion people maybe we can focus on on britain then because i guess the question still to me is to how how do we how do we know or or i rather i'd rather uh, just put it this way i'd love i'd love to have a picture painted of the different types of or what percentage of the 4 million muslims in britain believe x and believe so and so and so so you mentioned that we have sharia courts in Britain, how, how many, how, how, how widespread is Sharia courts in Britain? I've now been in America for almost three years. So in America, there's a huge culture of plugging your book, you know, yeah. whereas in Britain, we don't often do that. But I did that for Among the Mosques, my last book, when I went around, I, I talked to people who were running um, Sharia courts. And I spoke with people in mosques who were, you know, f functionaries for Sharia courts. I think we're up to about 100, 150 or so Sharia courts. It's hard to measure because they're informal. You know, five people can, get, can gather with a male imam and then form a judgment. So about a woman's, uh, you know, claim to a divorce or, uh, you know, her claims to custody stroke children or, uh, you know, her, her inheritance claims. So it's almost always targeted at women. Now, some women say it actually, it's actually helpful to have a community elder stroke imam of a mosque intervene. Others say it's damn right sexist and it creates a parallel legal system. Um, whatever it is, what we know is that these are institutions that now function across the country you know, all the way from Edinburgh down to, you know, Brighton, Bristol and throughout London. Um, and I'm sorry, it's just you've got to adapt to 21st century Britain and it's got to be one law for one land for all of its citizens. And as things stand, we can't deny the fact that there is inbuilt discrimination against a British citizen who comes from a Muslim background if she's a woman seeking divorce. There is. Uh, because of the Sharia courts, because of the Sharia courts who adjudicate, who who, who decide and who hold uh, the ultimate uh, decision as to who gets and does not get a divorce. So that, that that's that's just I think a tip of the iceberg, but that's part of a much wider culture of putting community before country, mm. um, and and Islamists are responsible for fermenting that culture. But to be fair, not everyone who goes to a Sharia court is an Islamist. It's just what's become the norm now, and people aren't thinking about it. One reason why it's become the norm is this government, or the previous Labour governments, will not outlaw Sharia courts. And as a result of them not outlawing, they function. And as far as long as Sharia courts function, you have a system for you know 4 million plus Muslims that sadly uh, reflects a different legal... Uh, mindset. Would you like to see them outlawed? I think Sharia courts should be outlawed in Britain, yes. Because, you know, why should my family members who are female, if they wish to get a divorce, if they were not Muslims, they'd be on preferential terms. Just because they're Muslims, they can't get uh, a, a, a divorce as quickly or as readily or as in a considered way without the involvement of uh, mostly men who are in, influenced by other men, um, who I'm sorry, just don't understand the complexities in which many of these women live. But but here's the interesting thing about Sharia. You know, marriage certificates can be drawn up, and the imams currently conduct marriages, fine, or draw up the certificates that gives the woman, from the very conception of the contract, her right to uh, divorce the man 
on his, you know, first mark of bad behavior. Right now, she has to go through, you know, three different divorce moments. He has to issue the divorce. He has to say, I'm divorcing you on three different accounts, three months apart. And then the imam decides whether it's valid or not. Now, anyway, I, I don't want that to get into from the Quran, right? Sorry. Does that come from the Quran? Um, good from question. The Surah good, Woman. Good question. Good question. Good question. Um, uh, I, I genuinely don't know. I'm not. I'm not trying to kind of deflect. I genuinely don't know. It probably does, but 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 let's assume it does. Um, I'm pretty sure it's in the surah on woman. Yeah. Okay. Let's assume it does, and let's go further. Let's assume that the Quran's, you know, Mr. Uh, Hadilun Thayyain, that you know, uh, that the woman inherits less. Let's let's inherit all of. Let's assume all of that's in the Quran. The whole point of the Quran is that we're able to adapt to time and place. The Quranic, you know, uh, verses um, were revolutionary for their time because uh, pagan society, as well as the Old Testament, did not grant women those rights mm -hmm. of inheritance, of divorce, recognition as a full soul on par with a man whose worship is looked upon by God. Now, in my eyes, the Prophet Muhammad is a feminist for having done all of that. So we go with the spirit of his achievements. And we say, we're now living in an age where you know, women are equal and free and should be treated as such. Muhammad should be treated as a feminist. In my view, Muhammad was a feminist. Okay, you're going to have he, to help me with this one. No, because he believed in gender equality. And I'll tell you why. No, he, but he, wait, no, no, no. He didn't believe in gender equality. Okay, he, uh, by the standards of his time. But he was, okay, if, he, if it's the word of God. Yes. God is above time. Yes. So... Why would God be doing things by the standards of time? Isn't morality is objective from time? It's not faddish. No, it's not about morality. It's about applying God's commands in time and place that is loyal to the spirit of what God wants. And why do I call the Prophet Muhammad a feminist? Because his enemies said to him, you know, the, 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 the Quraysh said to him, so you're now saying women can inherit land Women can conduct their own business. Um, uh, women have the right to enter the place of worship. And women can join battles. And uh, women are praying side by side with you men in the mosque. And women can lead armies because his wife Aisha leads an army. You, th this is where you're taking us. And he says, what's next? His enemies say to him, what's next? That horses have rights? Other animals have rights. And that and, and, and by the way, he is known in Mecca at his time for stopping the burial of girls of, of um, I forget the word now, but you know, when 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 in his infanticide or when children were born, it was norm among some families. If a, if a girl was born, she brought shame on the man because he couldn't produce a, a, a son. Therefore, they would kill their uh, bury their daughters alive. Prophet Muhammad stopped that. You know, so by those uh, metrics, in my eyes, he believed in gender parity, gender equality. I grant you, he wasn't in 2024, which is presentism, right? We're going to judge him by our time. But did he believe in greater female equality but, with men? Yes. But the presentism, that our time, that has evolved from thousands of years of, you know, debating morals and ethics. And De definitely we're speaking now in America and being a British that's at least in Britain it's 13 or sorry more like 1700 years of Christianity that's marinated British ethics and British morality to get to modernity and that's where we where we get to feminist rights and maybe in on some respects Prophet Muhammad did good things for women but in the in the chapter on women it's there's you couldn't you couldn't possibly call him a feminist when it, I think that in my memory it's been a few years since I read it was that it includes parts like the uh, part uh, uh, women not being able to divorce but men being able to divorce the women but also women has her her voice is worth a quarter of of a man now that's the word of God through Gabriel to Muhammad right her worth her testimony her testimony yeah okay but it's not much better uh, so no but but you're talking in a society where women could not give any testimony in court, that their, their opinions had no value. They were, you know, when a man in the Prophet Muhammad's time in Arabia, when, when a man died, 
his son inherited his wives, plural, and his daughters, plural. They, they were inherited along with camels and horses and property. That's what they were. Mm -hmm. And the Prophet Muhammad comes along and says, no, you can't do that. You can't inherit humans. He liberates them. He says they have rights. You can't bury them at birth. He says whoever's the father of a daughter is guaranteed paradise. He says paradise lies under the feet of your mother. He tries to elevate women. The Meccans call him an effeminate man because he loves smell, because he combs his hair, he grooms his beard, he trims his moustache. Now, that, see, my point is, so this is this is interesting, yeah. and this is the nub of the matter. Really, yeah. the issue, you know, it, it's about how we see this Arabian man, and that's really the nub of the issue. Because the Quran is what he bequeathed to us, and this Arabian man in the Western tradition has been slandered, has been misunderstood, has been called all kinds of names. But for most Muslims, you know, he is genuinely beloved, and, and there's a there's a tradition that he says. You know, Musa Kalimullah, Musa is the one who spoke with God. Isa Ruhullah, Isa was the soul of God. So we venerate Jesus as the soul of God. But he says that Muhammad I, himself is, is Habibullah, the beloved of God. And that's one of the things we try to do at the beginning of this conversation is emphasize that he was focused on, on Rahmatullah being the being, you know, uh, the most compassionate and kind towards humans. So we can discuss the two, and uh, we, can, we can we can have a to and fro on the on the personality of the prophet, and what he was. But you know, one of the one of the reasons why you know you and I can have this conversation, by the way, is because of him. And I'll explain why. Tell me. Yeah. I recognize your 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 Christian tradition. Yeah. I do that because he taught Muslims, you know, one thousand four hundred years ago in Arabia, and those teachings reach us today that we must honor Christians and Jews, that we must recognize that Jesus is a very special we, we re recognize him as messiah messiah sayyid al-messiah that he's you know the, the, our lord the messiah that's how we refer to him it's because of him the arabian prophet is he cons we, i thought he was considered a prophet but not no, messiah. messiah sayyid al-messiah the quran the same quran that you just referenced as you know, it refers to him as messiah again and again the messiah that's because of the arabian prophet we believe in the one god or the, uh, the, the of the judeo christian tradition because of this arabian prophet so you know, we owe this man so much, but I think, genuinely think he's the most denigrated and most misunderstood man in history. It's for these kind of reasons that you, we talk, you know, Muslims see him as someone who's most loved and beloved. And, you know, he was a feminist and, you know, he wanted to bring more justice to the world. And our non-Muslim friends have an allergic reaction to that definition. And that's why I think what we're doing is absolutely fantastic, by the way. It allows yeah, us to have yeah. this no, no, I, necessary I, I, conversation. I, I, I only call on, I mean, then maybe I'm getting... I'm happy to concede that on those levels, he improved some things for women, if it was that dire before. And if that makes him a feminist, then make him feminist. But my understanding of feminist is that it's for equal rights for, women's, for women. And then, and you'll have to correct me if I've got this wrong, but he, he married a six-year-old, is that not right? And I knew that was coming. <laughs> but no, no, but it, seeing as we're on the topic of yeah. feminism. Yeah, yeah, so, no, it's not right. It's, it's not. not right. Okay. It's, it's not right. And I know some of our kind of, that's why I appeal that we all listen at the outset. It's genuinely not right. It's not right for the following reasons. A, it's contested. Oh. B, it was summoned about 90 years after he's passed away in an Arab culture, attempting to show how macho he was. C, because he, in the Battle of Uhud, where Aisha, uh, Sayyidah Aisha is present, he made it a precondition that even men who are present were at least 14 years old. And D, because her sister, uh, say the Asma, who passes away before her, die, dies at the age of about 100, and we have that recorded. And by that definition, when, uh, when, when, the, me the, when the measuring is done of the time, she turns out to be about 17, 18. Now, again, I, I say this, we are judging him by presentism. You know, we're talking about a society in which, whether it's six or sixteen, wasn't measured in the way that we measure it today. But I will defend fair, his yeah, honor. Fair. I'll defend but, the prophet's honor because I think, a, we don't know. B, it's contested. C, it's presentism. And D, judge him on balance by what he did for women and for humanity, rather than by a contested, isolated incident. Well, fair enough. It, it is in, and, I, and this is a question I genuinely don't know the answer. Is the Prophet Muhammad considered infallible in Islam? 
Uh, it's again that's debated. The, 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 there are Muslims who think he was guided by the by by God to infallibility, but there were verses in the Quran where he makes mistakes and God corrects him. You know, But that's for God to correct him. It's not for us to correct him. I think one of the things I've learned by being around, you know, my Arab friends for the last, especially the last fifteen years or so, particularly visiting the United Arab Emirates, is that the Arabs, especially the the shuyukh, the Arab rulers, that the, the they have something called adab, you know, and the Prophet said adab and rabbi, you know, my Lord taught me adab, and it's from that approach of adab or the cultivation or maybe etiquette is the closest French stroke English word we have to it, that we don't we don't call out their mistakes. It's not for us. It's for us to follow them to divinity and salvation. And that's where we disagree with our Jewish friends and cousins, because the Old Testament is full of these these very flawed accounts of the Old Testament prophets. The Quran has no flawed accounts of any of the Old Testament prophets. So it's not that the prophet is seen to be infallible. It's that all prophets are seen to be guided by God. And if they are, it's not for us. We have the adab or the, or the etiquette to respect those who are chosen by God to guide humanity. So it's a different approach rather than kind of the postmodern approach of I will correct the past. It's just the past is what it is. And we humble ourselves and the prophets, both the, the, the prophets from the line of Isaac, i.e. the Jewish tradition and the line of Ismail, you know, Hud, uh, Shu'ib, uh, Muhammad, the Arabian prophets, both of those traditions, you know, I, I genuinely feel Ishmael or Ismail is the most kind of sidelined man in history that the whole line of prophethood of, that comes after him that is much more accepting and respectful of of the jewish prophets but we don't have that respect reciprocated from our christian and jewish friends that ah yes there's also an arabian prophet called muhammad or shu'ib in midian who gave shelter to moses when he comes out of uh egypt and i'm speaking i'm wondering will your audience follow us going down this I, I'm, I'm interested. I'm interested. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Because anyway. it, it kind of gets to because um, okay. Let, let's put it. Uh, you know, some of this is quite arcane, I guess. But it, uh, but it's interesting. But you've made uh, earlier in this conversation, you you sort of made a quite a clear line in the sand over um, Kutba, Said Kutba, and you call him the Lenin. I know we're not allowed to talk about individuals or, uh, 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 but uh, there, he's the, the past. Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, he, you know, as him is the beginning of Islamism. But if you, from an outside, for let, let's say a Christian point of view, you look at the history of Islam. It, it's a bloody history, and um, the, the not only did the, there was a peaceful time for in Muhammad's life in Mecca, but in it's Medina. He, there, there was it was more bloody tidy. The the religion was spread not only by trade and by its spiritual nature, but by the sword and by blood. And um, I mean, is it the uh, the Indian Empire, the um, um, Mughals? Yeah, the Mughals. Yeah. Historians think 110 million Hindus were killed by that empire. Now, maybe that's different because it's political, but rather than a Muslim empire, but there was a Muslim empire. So, and I guess that I would find it, I would want to understand how you've drawn that line with Said, because I would say you could actually go back and some of the Islamists of today, they take the literal version of the Quran and literal versions of the Hadith. And they would say to you, no, you're wrong. You're, you shouldn't be going by the presentism as you you shouldn't you shouldn't be trying to fit it with today's models you should listen to what Muhammad said said specifically and and by the way as a Christian that's how I approach Christianity it's like it's not about the fads of the day it's about what Christ said specifically so so I, I'm not sure exactly what my question here is but that's I well I guess what why that delineation at Said doesn't seem so obvious to me yeah um Firstly, uh, one of the most beautiful episodes in early Islam is Imam Ali. And, and he points at the Quran in one of the famous battles and says, this book is between two covers. It doesn't speak for itself. God gave us what Spinoza calls the natural gift of reason to understand and interpret 
whether it's the Quran or whether it's the Gospels or whether it's the Old Testament. And that's why Maimonides, Musa bin Maimon, in the Jewish tradition influenced by Islam, does exactly that with the Bible. So uh, as several points you mentioned there. I mean, I, I take issue with, with bloody history and kind of isolating Islam and Muslims with bloody history simply because it was the norm of the time. And, you know, you can only isolate someone from a crime if that's a crime, a civilization and a culture that's in keeping with what everyone else is doing at that time. I mean, if you're not conquering, you will be conquered. That was the code of the ancient world all the way down to around 1800. Um, so we're living in a post-colonial world, but those were, and by the standards of the time that Muslims had a successful colonizing program and that Muslims ruled from China all the way to Andalusia, I'm, I'm supposed to say sorry for that? No. I think there's something to be oh, said sorry. about, no, Muslims well, should be proud of that uh, inheritance, that Muslims were not kind of wiped out in Mecca, that Muslims were able to fight and respond. So I think that's the first first point to make, and that's not the same as Sayyid Qutb, and I'll explain why why in a moment. Um, can I, can I... Go ahead, yeah. On that, you know, you, you, you talk about the period of the time, of what it was at the time, but if you take someone like Jesus Christ, who was even earlier, 600 years earlier, he didn't. He was, he was preaching love. There was no. Yeah. There was no. Okay. So this is. Uh, yeah. I, I spent about two years of my life, especially having you know studied with Roger Scruton, with a great level of admiration and draw towards Jesus Christ. Yeah. So I know exactly what it is that forces you from within to say that, and I respect that. But here's the difference. Yeah. Jesus, you know, alayhi salam, upon him be peace. Uh, you know, Sayyidina al Masih, as we say in Arabic, our Lord, the Messiah preached only for two and a half years. That's all. And his fight was with a small group of rabbis in the temple. And he was a rabbi who was fighting within the Jewish community. The Prophet Muhammad, in contrast, was preaching for 23 years in the harsh pagan Arab culture to Jews, Christians, pagans, Romans, Greeks, Persians, Africans. It's an entirely different field. And in that field, he did what Jesus did for 10 years, you know, turned the other cheek, wouldn't fight back. And then he realized that the Christians gave him comfort. And that's why we bow our heads to the Abyssinians, because the people of Ethiopia gave the prophets family and friends political asylum and, and shelter. But after 10 years of turning the other cheek, he then takes up David's roots, Solomon's root, you know, the Old Testament prophets and says, we will now fight back. And he fights back. And that's why when we say Islam has a bloody history, he fights back against pagan persecution. But this is, you know, it's war is evil at all times. And I'm not shying away from that. But he has conditions in fighting. He says, you will not poison wells. You will not kill the innocent, i.e. You know, women and children. You will not attack the religious. You will not destroy religious buildings. And I know in, in the kind of framing of this question, you, you talked about Hindus and India and however many killed. I mean, A, I can contest the numbers, but I'll say this. All of those attacks on Muslims that, um, you know, we killed and we maimed and we... Uh, then why are there Hindus in India today? If Muslims were so intolerant, they'd ruled India for a good part of 800 years. And they could have converted everyone, but they don't. Muslims don't. Why are there Christians in large parts of the Middle East until the recent intolerance of the Islamists? Because Muslims more or less let... let why were there more Jews and Christians historically all throughout the Ottoman Empire uh, than Muslims were in the in, in Western lands or Christendom? Was because Islam was seen to be much more accepting and pluralist. And that's where I say the Qutb is a problem because he breaks with that pluralist... Uh, Muslim past that even someone such as Bernard Lewis uh, venerates. Bernard Lewis is a kind of historian with a very strong Zionist bent, and he concedes that, I mean, 1492, you know, uh, Andalus falls, and uh, King Bo Abdul does a deal with uh, Isabel and Ferdinand in you know, uh, 1491, around December, that I will surrender Granada, I will surrender the last outpost of Muslim Spain. But my condition to the Catholic monarchs is as follows, that don't nullify any of the marriages of the Muslims, don't take any of the places of worship, and don't force the eating of pork. And at his weakest position, King Bar Abdul says, and I want the Catholic monarchs to do the same thing for my Jewish subjects. Do not nullify the marriages, do not destroy the synagogues, do not impose pork on them. This is a matter of historical record. 
Isabel and Ferdinand agree, and by uh, March 1492, they slaughter Jews and Muslims. Now, my point isn't to say who is better, who is worse. My point is to say there was a pluralist uh, tradition within Muslims, a Muslim civilization. And then when, you know, Sultan Bayezid, I think, in the Ottoman Empire hears that Jewish people are being expelled, he not only rescues them, he sends the Ottoman navy to take Jewish people into uh, Ottoman lands. Now, that was the way of the Ottomans. And I'm not saying, therefore, we should recreate a caliphate. I'm saying that was the norm of the day. And one of the beauties of the teachings of Bin Beya uh, of the United Arab Emirates is that the teachings of today are nation states, are citizenship, are secular laws, and are respecting each, and, each, uh, 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 each nation state, including Israel, on the level of coexistence. And I think that's what we should be getting towards rather than, I mean, we can have this debate and discussion about the prophet and about history, and I will defend. Because, no, no, of course, because I'm a Muslim and I, 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 yeah, yeah. I, from conviction, but I have a soft spot both for Judaism and Christianity on the grounds of the miracles of the Jewish people, of their loyalty and their love for the one God, you know, uh, and the protection of the one God in the toughest points of the Holocaust. And, you know, I was born on Christmas Day and I've always had this special connection with Jesus. But I know in my heart of hearts that I would not love Jesus or have a soft spot for my Jewish cousins had it not been for the Arabian prophet Muhammad. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think today's civilizations, plural across the world, owe something to that Arabian prophet who taught his community and then today 1.8 billion people that something about the Messiah Jesus and something about the importance mm -hmm. of the Jewish people having a claim to Jerusalem and to Israel. We get that from him. And yeah. that's why I defend and I'm loyal to you know, my own prophet and my faith tradition, because I think to do otherwise was to, it, is to have that bad adab, you know, the yeah. kind of the bad etiquette. You, you made an earlier point, which was that, or um, and maybe it was a point in passing, why aren't Muslims granted the same respect that is granted to Jews and Christians, as you've just done? Uh, and I guess my immediate thought to that would be that, well, Christians, for example, for, for a start, believe that Christ was the Son of God and the Messiah. And so the teachings of Prophet, Prophet Muhammad would be blasphemous in their mind. So they, so they don't agree. Now, there's respect as in, you know, respect, love thy neighbor, respect Muslims as a neighbor. But... They, they would reject the the ideology and the religion because it would be blasphemy to them. Uh, that's my that's why I, I think that there's a not the same respect. Yeah. Well, you see, that's a doctrinal position within Christianity, which is, I, I respect it, but I disagree with it for the obvious reason that you know, Christians in the East uh, opposed the Nicene doctrine and that's why there were other churches, Nestorians and others, that flourished. One, two, um, you know, I don't want to appear disrespectful. I, I, I respect the view that you've outlined. But you know, for those of us who are Muslims, you know, we believe that God is one like our Jewish cousins. Allahu um, Ahad, Allah is one. Lam yalid wa lam yulad, that he was not born and nor does he beget. He wasn't begotten, nor does he beget. Um, and, and one reason why, you know, the Prophet Muhammad then that the birth of Islam is to do with that correction of doctrine. By the way, had there not been a Trinitarian tradition within Christianity, um, it's hard to imagine that, that the birth of Islam and its success, because it spoke to that very Muslim core of being reasonable and being what we call fitra oriented, you know, nature and natural. God, you know, the, the, again, there's a beautiful verse in the Quran that Laysa ka mithli his shape. There's nothing unto God, nothing like God. So we, we, we find it hard, A, to imagine, B, to accept that God would have uh, as a son. But, but we respect the fact that our Christian friends venerate Jesus to the highest degree and it's a way of veneration. So I think we can come to a agree to disagree position on that and live and let live and you know i want to see 50 million muslims in the west thrive and i want to see more christians in the middle east and that's that's where i think that there's a real crisis of civilization that there are fewer christians today in the middle east mm -hmm. than historically because of that influence of the Sayyid Qutb mindset you know but now we have 50 million muslims in the, in the in the west for the first time in history how do we live together yeah but how do we ensure that christians in the middle east for example in the uae there's 
a church and there's a synagogue and the mosque side by side. There's a synagogue in Bahrain and there are churches in Bahrain. How do we have churches in Saudi Arabia? How do we have? What's Kutba got to do with that? He he uh, revived a worldview that 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 created Hamas. That, for example, in Israel today, there are twenty percent of the population that that are Muslims and Arabs and Christians, but in Gaza there isn't a single Jew. Why not? Why can't Gaza have Jewish citizens? Why can't Palestine have Jewish citizens? And that's something to do with that Hamas mindset that mm -hmm. this must be Jew free. Because Qutb wrote a book called, you know, Our Battle with the Jews, in which he talks in great anti-Semitic, anti-Zionist. Mm. To him, there was no distinction between anti-Semitic and anti-Zionist. It was the same thing, by the way. Which, incidentally, um, and that's why Qutb is relevant, and thank you for asking that question, is that was in was, was translated by the, now the supreme leader of Iran, Khamenei. Uh, he translates those in the 50s and 60s. Qutb's books influenced the Iranian government's worldview. And that's where Qutb is relevant. He is not some kind of sideshow. Just as Stalin was influenced by Lenin, and Lenin was influenced by Marx, you know, Maududi and Hassan al-Banna influenced Qutb, and Qutb's writings influence uh, this Islamist movement that's intolerant and that, that won't allow for Jews and Christians and others to thrive in a pluralist, tolerant Middle East. Do you think that's fundamental to the, an the rise in anti-Semitism that we're seeing, not only... Well, not only in Britain, but across the West. The, the, the rise in anti-Semitism is sadly to do with, 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 with the rise in Islamism, yes, that our identity, first and foremost, has got to be some kind of global uh, religious identity rather than you and I are Brits and our loyalty, first and foremost, is to our state politically. But you're also a Christian, I'm a Muslim, and we have a spiritual community around the world. But politically, our loyalty is to our nation state. The Islamists won't accept that loyalty to the nation state. Mm. They want to recreate some kind of entity, caliphate, call it whatever they want. And therefore, uh, that collectivism, so uh, you know, a situation in Gaza means Muslims in Britain must respond to Gaza because we won't respond to the Uyghurs, we won't respond to the Syrians, we won't respond to the Sudanese, we won't respond to the Somalians or indeed the Kashmiris, but somehow Gaza is more important because Gaza is warped in faith and faith that's politicized. So it's about Jerusalem, it's about Hamas, it's about loathing the other faith community, i.e. Jews, conveniently wrapped up now in, in, in Israeli identity rather than seeing them British Jews as Brits and British Muslims as Brits. Whatever happens in a third country, let Muslims and Jews in that country sort it, i.e. Israel and Palestine, why does that cross borders and make me now more Palestinian than the Palestinians? I, by the way, I was in Israel on October 7th. Were you? I was there when the, when the terrorist attack happened. So I don't need lecturing by Hamas or uh, others on um, you know, being more loyal to... to uh, I, mean, I, I spent time in bunkers with Arabs and Jews. So when Hamas attacks and throws lobby, lobbies... Uh, rockets into Tel Aviv in our hotels, the vast majority of the staff in Jerusalem, in, in Tel Aviv and elsewhere, are Arab. So we're in bunkers day after day, night after night, because of Hamas's attacks. I say this only to illustrate the point that our loyalties in this day and age are to the nation state. And that's why when I watch the protests in London, or indeed here in Washington, D.C., the thing that strikes me most is that not a single British flag or an American flag is at those so-called pro-Palestinian protests, marches, whatever we wish to call them. Where is their loyalty to yeah. the nation state? Because when I don't see a Union Jack at those protests, I'm sure it's not just me. Most people in the country are slightly suspicious. And same here in America, which is much more patriotic, that when people don't see the American flag in those protests, they know it's a foreign issue that you're trying to impose on us. Whereas when I go... Uh, and see Israeli protests, or marches for Israel, similarly in, in, in Trafalgar Square when there are, you know, solidarity marches, I see the Union Jack or I see here the American flag. And I think that's the message. And I know it's not only a popular message for my Muslim friends, but that's the issue. You have got to be loyal to your country and show that you're a son or a daughter of this soil first, that the NHS, 
that unemployment, that dereliction in our cities, the neglect in our countryside, those things matter to you. And then people will listen to you about some foreign policy qualm. But if your foreign policy, foreign policy qualm comes first, then I'm afraid people will just see it as that, a third, fourth, fifth rate issue, and you won't get listened to. So show and be loyal to your country first and care for it first and foremost, and then you might get a hearing on justice somewhere else. Why, do you, why, why did you say that you didn't think it would be popular with your Muslim friends, Muslim listeners? I, I, just judging by the kind of people on the, on the protests, and I think there might be the fact that the flag isn't flying, um, the fact that in most mosques, I don't, I, when I was traveling for writing among the mosques, the Union Jack wasn't present. But when I go to the synagogues, I see them present. When I'm at a synagogue, I hear them, the rabbis praying for the British Armed Forces. You know, I don't hear prayers in our mosques for, in those days, Her Majesty the Queen. And that troubles me. You know, there's, there's, there's an issue here of loyalty. And that's, that's what we've got to address. And that's why Saint Qutb's brand of Islamism tried to divert us to a future caliphate, work towards an Islamic state, um, is so dangerous because A, it's not going to happen, B, it's a lie, and C, it destroys families and communities today, and D, it sets us up, not just to clash among Muslims, but the moment younger Muslims are under Islamist influence and they move to the Islamist far right, Muslim supremacy, uh, Muslim only areas, you know, Muslim women must marry only Muslim. When when we go down that far right route, uh, what happens is you will see a response from the white working class, and that's also racist. And if we're going to call that supremacist, racist, fascist, Nazist, it it just stands to logic that I must call the other side also supremacist and racist and fascist for wanting that totalitarian state. Mm. So that's why it's so dangerous that when we are not able to show, exhibit, display and behave as citizens of a country first and foremost, even in our protests, you know, then, then, you know, then we're, up, we're setting ourselves up for a failure. And the failure is this, Winston. Our historical moment is unique. The fact that we have 50 million Muslims living in these countries across the West, the fact that every Muslim country, 52 nation states, now have mostly secular laws and... Um, mostly nation states are not not looking to recreate empires. The fact that we see ourselves as individuals and not parts of tribes and collectives is a historical first. You know, the fact that we have gender equality in the eyes of the law is a historical first. The Romans didn't get there, the Greeks didn't get there. We as humans are geared towards tribalism. And my fear is that if we continue down the Islamist route for the Qutb influenced Muslims, and if we continue down the Leninist route for the more progressive elements of the left, we undo our contract as citizens with a nation state and secular laws. And uh, what we unleash is the far left and the far right and the Islamist right fighting among each other and forcing the rest of the population mm. to make a choice. And that undoes the last and a post-Second World War consensus that has allowed for multiculturalism, multi-ethnic democracies to emerge in the world. And that's what's at stake, our you know, civilizations at their core. Mm. Well, look, obviously, like you, I think this goes about saying, I want to know how all, these, all, all of us can live together because we are living together. And so I want to know what that road looks like. And you've been heavily involved with de-radicalization. You're co-founder of Quilliam, which I... I think you closed down a couple of years ago, but for many years was the leading organization for moderate Muslims in Britain for de-radicalization. And um, you'll be familiar with the PREVENT program that was started after 7-7, uh, the 7-7 bombings, 2005, and which William Shawcross has done a big expose on, a, cr a critique of showing how it's not fit for purpose. It's been a bit of a disaster. I, I, I'll, I'll ask this question loosely, but it's on the question of de-radicalization or the path towards integration, perhaps. Where are we now in Britain with these different organizations? What's working, what's not working? And how is it that we can get to that that, pl that place where we are British brothers and sisters 
standing side by side peacefully. Yeah, beautifully put. And I think I've got to, got to start with the good news. You know, um, when I was running around Britain about three summers ago, uh, writing among the mosques, the thing that struck me, and again, you know, people may disagree, but it's up to them, and I, I won't censor myself, is that two rewarding moments, um, a mosque in Edinburgh, where I walked in, and there in the mosque kitchen, there was a gay couple sat there eating. You know? And I thought that was a beautiful moment that you could have in a mosque, a non-Muslim uh, gay couple that chose the mosque as their uh, lunch location in Edinburgh. You know, that, th th there was something there about the pluralism. And then I went to a, uh, a community center in Birmingham, and I saw uh, a, a lady wearing hijab, um, working with homosexual couples on HIV and AIDS related issues. And the fact that you could have a Muslim woman in hijab working with a with with non Muslims and Muslim homosexual couples, I'm not saying it's right or wrong homosexuality. Right, that's between God and the individual. We're all sinners, but the point is that Britain can produce that that Muslim woman in a headscarf lovingly looking after her fellow citizens what's surprising about that is because where she because as a conservative hijab wearing muslim woman she is expected to frown on homosexuality but she's not mm -hmm. she's suspended her judgment and she sees them as creatures of god and mm -hmm. she sees them as fellow citizens and if that's possible in birmingham it can be possible elsewhere living together as you know, British brothers and sisters. But I think it's only possible if we teach that in our schools, genuine patriotism. And, you know, my teacher, Roger Scruton, used to talk about patriotism as being inclusive, not exclusive, not keeping others out. In other words, children of the soil. And that, by the way, is different, you know, than, say, Germany or from the Slavic countries or, 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 or India or Nigeria or Japan or elsewhere. I mean, I can spend the next 10 years of my life in any of those countries and I'd never be Japanese or Nigerian. I just wouldn't. Right? But I could spend 10 years in an English-speaking country, i.e. in America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and England that guided the world into that, where someone like Roger Scruton and others on the right, unlike Heidegger and others on the German right, are prepared to say, yes, you too are British for as long as, or German, or, or, or forgive me, uh, you know, American, Australian, or New Zealand. And that's why this country here in America works, because in the armed forces, you have black, Chinese Americans, and, you know, uh, German Americans and others side by side prepared to go and defend liberty and freedom in the world. Why do I say that? I say that because it's taught in schools here in America, and it should be taught in schools in Britain. I know we're kind of a bit squeamish about national identity. But we have two choices. You either be squeamish and we lose a country and an identity, or you assert that Britain has a lot to be proud of. We're not saying our history's flawless, but we have a lot to be proud of and instill that civic pride in a younger generation. What stands in our way? And that's what's got to be removed. And I don't believe in being too prescriptive about you know what civic pride should look like, but I do believe it involves the following. It involves isolating the enemies, in this case, whether it's the extreme left that doesn't believe in nation states, that wants to destroy nation states and create some kind of you know, global utopia, flawed and failed since the days of Karl Marx to now, um, or it's the far right that wants to create a fourth Reich of some sort, or it's the Islamist racist far right that want to create something only for Muslims and ex exclude Jews and others. All three are a threat to what I'm about to identify, you know, a nation state based order. So why, you know, so we have to remove the Muslim Brotherhood from the public domain in the UK, just as we've removed uh, the, the racists and other terrorist supporting organizations. So, so that I think is a matter of legislation and Tom Tugendhat and others are doing a fantastic job on prescribing Hizb tahrir and looking at others. But what is it, you know, for me that distinguishes Britain? Mm. Yes, it's history. Yes, it's language. Yes, it's culture. Yes, it's laws. But I think underlying, you know, Britain and Britain's influence in the rest of the world is, is it's first that, you know, thanks to John Locke and others, we have a reason oriented culture. By reason, I mean, practical reason derived from revelation. Unlike other cultures, we don't totally dismiss the power of faith. It's, it's held in 
balance with human reason as it should be. So that again is in keeping with with the Islamic tradition that honors, you know, the Quran again and again talks about afala taqirun, afala tafakkirun, do you not think, do you not reflect. So reason. The second is the fact that we honor individualism in Britain. That you know, we we don't particularly care which tribe you're from and you're not expected to adhere to a tribal conduct, nor do we see you as a kind of collective member of a trade union or, I don't know, your gender identity or sexual. And that's just private. It's up to you by definition. It's private. So I think that individualism, uh, again, chimes with our faith tradition because in Islam we don't have a pope and our relationship is direct with God. So Muslims should be able to comfortably live with both the reason and the individualism that underpins British culture. Third is where there is genuine contest. Uh, it is gender parity. You know, I, I think the Prophet Muhammad was a feminist by the standards of his time, but Muslims haven't continued in his spirit. So I blame Muslims for not being able to uh, align fully with full gender parity. And that's where we've got to get to. And that's where I think Britain is uh, a laudable example of where in the eyes of the law, women and men are equal. I'm not saying we're equal biologically, you know, it'd be naive to say otherwise, but but in the eyes of the law, we are equal. We complement each other in our lives as husbands, wives, as partners, and so on. Um, and and then, then then I think Britain is unique in its openness. Uh, it's a Karl Popper's form of openness, that we are open to uh, legal migration. We are open to new ideas, new cuisines, new way of doing things um, and being challenged. And finally, and that's why, again, Britain is unique, is its racial equality. Um, I've just traveled in the Middle East and I travel often to other parts of the world. It's only when you come back to either England or America, you realize, despite all of our qualms, how much racial equality we've embedded. I mean, at the time of speaking, our prime minister is a gentleman from a different skin tone. But then in the, in the, in the century before last, the Disraeli was a prime minister from a Jewish heritage. Um, Boris Johnson, famously from a Mongol background, you know, part Russian, part Turkish, part we don't know. You know, so there is that long tradition of Britain giving birth to mm. uh, a, you know, a culture of racial openness. You know, we abolish slavery. We we get damned all the time for being responsible for the slave trade, while we overlook you know the Turkish government's involvement for the slave trade. So th that I think, and I talk about this in my book Among the Moss, the reason, individualism, gender parity, openness and racial equality, i.e. rigor, um, as an acronym that's in my head that explains why Britain is unique. And if we can embed that among a younger generation under, the, uh, under it being housed and homed and framed as British contributions to the modern world, what that means is that we're distinctly different from Islamists. The Muslim Brotherhood cannot touch us any on any of that. They're anti-open, they're anti-reason, they're anti-individual because they believe in collectivism, they don't believe in gender equality, and they're most certainly not open. So that, for me, is the demarcation between the Islamist extremists that are trying to derail not just Britain but other countries um, and mainstream Britain. And I, and I want to say this too, if I may, Winston, that this is not just some academic uh, exercise in thought. If we don't get this right in the next 20 to 25 years, what we will see is at least 40 to 45 constituencies in Birmingham, in Leicester, in Batley, in Rochdale, in parts of London, in Slough and elsewhere, which will form Muslim majority ghettos. And that's a genuine risk because what happens then? Do we have Muslim or Muslim Islamist influence political parties because where there's a Muslim majority, Islamists will agitate just to have the, just as they've done in Algeria, in Tunisia, in Gaza. They tried in Egypt. That's a real risk. Well, George Galloway's just been elected in Rochdale. He's the first among us to come, and this man will be a model. And I don't want to name names because of a, the, the Sorry, kind yeah. of issue from our teacher, Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayer. But the point is that the, that model has been used already once in Tower Hamlets, secondly in Bradford, now in Rochdale that model will then be used again in the future. And I think that's what we've got to think about, that do we pass this burden onto future generations or do we do what Edmund Burke did, speak the truth, stand by our allies, in his case, the Americans, but who opposed the French Revolution, and then do what's right, regardless of where the pieces fall. Mm. And that's why, you know, I think it's worth for all of us to read Edmund Burke's works. Not only was he a devout Christian, but but it's just the way he was able to 
be guided by God, tradition, faith, and make the right call at every juncture, whether it was on slavery, on India, on Irish self-rule, mm. or on the American Revolution or the French Revolution. He called it right. Um, and and so, so now, almost 150 years later, we admire him for what, for what he did. And the same point applies for us today. We've got to identify these issues now and address them for what they are and isolate the extremes in all, th all three, three areas to ensure that Britain continues to flourish and flower as a beacon of hope mm. and liberty for us and for future generations. I, I mean, I agree with so much of that. And, and you know, Britain is a successful multi-ethnic state because it's bound by those that those philosophies that build up built up over hundreds of years the conversation as you know back home is that about multiculturalism and i think what you're identifying is the beginning of multiculturalism failing now even saying multiculturalism has failed when david cameron said it angela merkel said it but now swella braverman famously lost her job as home secretary for saying multiculturalism failed amongst other things what my question is, and I've asked this to a few of my guests, okay, it's it's good to identify what where you know where we're at, what binds us. In fact, it's pretty hard to identify, I would say. Some people have struggled to answer that question and you've and you've done a beautiful job of it. My question then is, how on earth do we actually practically and in policy have that that work of assimilation and integration? How do we do it? I think it happens the moment you remove the obstacles. And the obstacles at the moment are on all three fronts are these political extreme factions. And they've always been there, by the way. It's just whenever there are political difficulties, they emerge much more strongly and they entrench them in the political space. Hannah Arendt famously says, if someone threatens to kill you, you take it seriously. And she was talking about it in terms of the threat to Jewish people. Right now, the thing that we've got to absolutely fix in Britain, looking at it from, from, from afar, is that this increased anti-Semitism, this hatred of Jewish people across the country, whatever happens in Gaza, whatever happens in Palestine, and whatever happens in Israel, happens over there. Yes, Jewish people have a love and loyalty for Israel, I understand that. And yes, those of us who are Muslims have a love and loyalty for Mecca and Medina, I understand that. But it doesn't then follow that we take our spiritual difficulties and then we start turning on each other in our countries, because then what we do is we break that contract between state and citizen. And once that's broken, it's hard to fix. So what we do immediately is to identify the the, the, the source of that, which is in, in the most cases, Muslim Brotherhood led or Muslim Brotherhood affiliated or Muslim Brotherhood legacy organizations in bed with the far left, uh, f focused against Israel, against Jewishness, against America and against Britain. I think that's the most urgent thing, securing our most treasured minority communities here, whether they're Jewish communities or Muslim communities. There, there shouldn't be a tension between those two communities for all kinds of reasons. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, and, I'm, and I'm sorry to say that, we, we need to revisit the way the Muslim Brotherhood has been, has been treated in Britain. The Muslim Brotherhood used to gather in Mecca annually at the Hajj. Prince Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia has banned that. Now they gather on a regular basis in London. How did London become the new Mecca for the Muslim Brotherhood, a global Islamist organization that seeks our destruction, seeks the removal of Israel and supports suicide bombings? And that's where we are. So when you say they're meeting in London, what do you mean they're meeting? They have um, more than 70 chapters, some say 75, some say 78 chapters around the world. The global leadership meets or the global leadership is coordinated from a location that location used to be Mecca because Mecca was immune to global media scrutiny. People or you know, Muslim Brotherhood members could come in under the guise of uh, doing the pilgrimage. But but the, the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman has banned the Brotherhood and made Hamas illegal. Whereas in Britain, the Muslim Brotherhood is not banned. They have television channels, media uh, platforms, what they call socials, charities, mosques um, and other institutions. Now, even as I say this, so in my head, so I, I disclose this only people, so people know the kind of risks we have to take. You know, so I have, you know, my mother lives in England. The rest of my family is here in America. My mother lives in England. And I, as I say this, I think about the safety concerns from my mother. I shouldn't have to. I shouldn't have to be, you know, in an English speaking country, our great ally here in America, and think about my mother's safety because I'm talking about the Islamist extremists that are the Muslim Brotherhood that could 
and most probably will knock on my mother's door for, for calling that they be isolated, they be prosecuted. Elements of them should be banned because we know that they have connections to Hamas and they have connections to other terrorist organizations active in multiple theaters, you know, Iraq, Lebanon, Yemen, uh, Tunisia, Libya. And so the list is long and that, that's all coordinated from London. And our, our, part of our problem is our intelligence services don't want to look at the Muslim Brotherhood because it, A, it's too big and B, they want to see it as a counter to Al-Qaeda or ISIS. But that's a short-termist view. It's, it's, it's a deeply short-termist view. Um, that's on the international scale, right? On the side, rather than... On, uh, so for MI5, for example, w why wouldn't it be as simple for them to, for them to say that in Britain... Muslim Brotherhood is prescribed. You, it sounds like that's what you're suggesting. Because they won't be able to um, uh, supply the evidence for the actions that I've just highlighted because they're not gathering the intelligence. They won't be committing to surveillance of some of the individuals in the major institutions of Islamists parading as ordinary Muslims in London because they, they're, they're not authorised by law to do that just because they think they're not a terrorist organisation. But they are, by virtue. So the question is, what changed now? Well, what changed now after October seventh is multiple organisations, organised and led by the Islamists in Britain, have refused to condemn Hamas. Worse, supported Hamas, organised and mobilised the protest, and most worryingly, threatened Jewish communities. So this is the challenge for Keir Starmer, that if we, by we I mean ordinary Muslims and the British government and our Saudi, Emirati, and other allies ban the Muslim Brotherhood in Britain because of its anti-Semitism and its hatred for Jewish people and, and the 300% increase on anti-Semitism across London streets, will Keir Starmer uphold that ban or not? That's the challenge for Keir Starmer. Because I th my sense is the Muslim Brotherhood will eventually be banned, be it before him or after him. But does he fold under the far left in his party and the Jeremy Corbynites who have been close buddies with the Muslim Brotherhood in its mosques in North London and uh, uh, multiple other, I, I don't want to go into details, but, but, but the fact is you know, he's been a lifelong friend of the Muslim Brotherhood at the East London Mosque and other locations. So what happens at that point? Does he, Keir Starmer, uphold the ban or not? And I think that is an important issue for the upcoming general election, that we ensure that the ban is held. Wouldn't he be doing that, or would he be doing that to appease his Muslim voter base, like he needs the Muslim, the Muslim vote. Although, might it be the case that the Muslim voter base would want Muslim Brotherhood banned? Well, or is the, Mus is the Muslim voter base actually split on the issue? Well, that's why what you're doing is so important, Winston, because you're educating your audience to delineate between ordinary, mainstream, faith-loving Muslims who are often the victim of Islamist intimidation, both in Muslim-majority countries and in the West, and, and B, Islamists who say, oh, we're just ordinary Muslims, which they're not, the kind of agitators for a political project. And that's why having Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Egypt and other Muslim majority countries supporting the ban of the Muslim Brotherhood is vital. So when we have support from those countries, ordinary Muslims will realize it's not the British government going after Muslims. It's Mecca, it's Medina, it's Abu Dhabi, it's in Dubai, it's Cairo, mm. it's, you know, it's, it's, it's significant Muslim capital saying yeah. these guys are enemies of the state in our country. They've mobilized and attacked our political elite as well as institutions, uh, religious and otherwise in our countries. And they're fundraising actively to bring destruction to British Muslims, European Muslims, and uh, a, a peaceful form of Islam globally. I think that's the secret that, that uh, and if I may, Winston, at this point, I, I can hear, you know, people say, ah, oh, yes, but what about democracy? You know, so Isaiah Berlin made a powerful argument why it's liberty and the rule of law that is much more important than democracy. Because if we don't have liberalism and the rule of law, what we have is Hamas in Gaza, the FIS in Algeria, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, using the ballot box, procedural elections, and then saying, ah, oh, yes, but we won, won in the democratic elections. And then we in the West get weak at our knees and say, ah, oh, yes, they're Democrats in Iran and we can't. No, no, they're not Democrats. Mm. 
they're fascists that are using the electoral process to impose a totalitarian government. So that's, hence the focus must be, are those governments liberalizing, i.e. You know, Saudi Arabia and other nations, and are they upholding the rule of law? And where they're not, there should be greater pressure put that they do, but where they are, we work with them to combat a common enemy, i.e. the Islamists trying to wreak havoc on our streets, as well as remove those governments that are our allies. I'm keen to get to geopolitics because you have amazing insights into that but just before moving on from what's going on in Britain you'll have seen that in France there was a Tunisian imam who had been in France since 1986 he's called Majoub Majoubi and he was after within I think hours of arrest he was deported from France for spreading hateful I don't know what content or you know uh, maybe it was uh, in, in a mosque he was saying something beyond the pale. Um, the response in Britain was, I think, from government, they said something like, oh, we're, we're considering doing the same sort of thing. It seems to me that in Britain, the responses have become weaker and weaker and weaker, at least after the 7-7 bombings. They were able to have the conversation to start the Prevent program, which and at least there was an attempt to deal with the issue. It seems now that there's very little that is being on the, on the political level that's being, people aren't prepared to really talk about the issues. Like two, two weeks ago, Parliament went against protocol to protect MPs from Islamist threats and death threats. Well, that's a sign of but, things to come, Winston. That, yeah, that's so, the but, thing. so how, how, I mean, it seems pretty, pretty dire, the political classes in Britain, and you've got some insight into that, that things that they're getting weaker and weaker, right? Well, that's a sign of things to come. Britain currently lacks leadership mm. and the Conservative Party feels tired in government. Um, there are several ministers who are energetic and understand this. After the 7th of July terrorist attacks, I think you know, we've got to give credit where it's, where it's due. Tony Blair gripped this. You know, he, he was deeply focused on the battle of ideas because he understood that from a previous life where he had prosecuted the far left wing of the Labour Party. So he understood ideas and the impact of ideas. I'm not persuaded that, um, I don't want to mention names of individuals, I'm, I'm not persuaded that's where we are at the moment in Britain. And I'm not persuaded that the uh, after the next general election we'll, we'll, we'll get there either. Um, so, but, that, but that's the real issue, that there's got to be leadership that understands the battle of ideas, understands the risks that we face for the future of our country and then grips it in order to isolate our enemies in a way that Margaret Thatcher did. And I say this as someone who comes from a, you know, a, a Labour voting family, um, that, that she understood the threat from Irish terrorism and she tackled it head on. Mm. And I think as a result of that, what you then had with John Major and Tony Blair being able to make peace in Northern Ireland. So we need a prime minister that, that has the leadership skills that has the energy that has the intellectual grasp of these issues and then has the the commitment to fixing it standing by our allies in the in the arab and muslim world and then isolates the islamist extremists as well as the far left and the far right and and in all of this the jewish people are really the canary in the coal mine and i say that as someone you know who is deeply loyal to my own faith tradition because what starts with jews doesn't end with jews what what what's what's going on in england now the fact that Jewish friends can't walk in central London uh, and, and and the fact that um, yeah. the so-called pro-Palestinian marches, when they see a placard condemning Hamas, they turn on that placard. If you're against Hamas, then why are you turning on a guy condemning Hamas? Mm -hmm. This has happened several times now in, in, this, in this protest. I think that culture has got to be fixed. Mm -hmm. And that comes, I'm afraid, from political leadership. Worth noting, you see, first it starts with the Jews. Well, also... Uh, uh, I'll say that the charity Tell Mama have said that uh, anti-Muslim hate has increased um, by 335% since October 7th. So there, there's, there's, it's, it's happening you know, to all groups now, really, in Britain. Um, so uh, I think you made a good point there. But where I have hope, and it's not coming from within Britain, I'm very pessimistic about Britain. I don't see any of these political leaders, and you say it starts at the political level. 
I don't see any, I see very few people in Westminster who have who have real courage to do all these things. Certainly none of them in, in positions of leadership at the moment. Where I see hope is with the Abraham Accords. For me, what they show in the Abraham Accords where Morocco, Bahrain, the Emiratis and uh, Sudan signed a deal brokered by Trump and Jared Kushner with Israel. For me, that shows that there are Arab nations and Muslim nations who want peace, cooperate, cooperation and trade with Israel and with the West. And for me, that is exciting. Mm. Now, you've been, you, you have to educate me here, but you, you've been involved with the Negev Forum. And is that directly involved or indirectly involved with the Abraham Accords? That's the interstate uh, function here in Washington, D.C., based out of the State Department um, or, or interagency mechanism of sorts, if you like. But um, I direct something called the N7 Initiative that works with the seven uh, Arab countries that have normalized relations. And we have other countries that, that are looking to normalize relations with Israel. What are the other three? Uh, in addition to the ones that you've just identified, uh, Egypt and Jordan, um, and one other, uh, Morocco, no, Morocco you've identified for Egypt and Jordan are the most significant too. Okay. But the other will come to me in a moment. And, and so what, what, what exactly is it that you're doing with the negative for? Well, well, the, the point, the, end, po the point of the N7 yes, is sir. that we regularly convene, uh, our Arab and Israeli friends, uh, on a whole range of issues, but then in those meetings, sometimes behind closed doors, sometimes in public, we also invite other countries. So on October 10th, what we had planned were delegations from significant Muslim majority nations, including Turkey, by the way, uh, finance minister from Turkey was scheduled to attend and others, and we will get there. So that's the good news. And that's the hope that we will return to that work. Um, we're doing other work at the moment, some of it kind of much more quiet than other uh, than others. But you know, you will see the N7's work return to the public domain, because the, the work supports exactly what you just identified. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm generally happy you mentioned the Abraham Accords because they are um, a model for where the Middle East can get to. Mm. And, and, and to say uh, just, just a couple of words in, in response to your point about T.S. Eliot famously warned us that we should always have hope, um, that, 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 that the secret of Western civilization, in which I also include Muslims, by the way, is that never give up hope. Um, Moses, one of the last things he said that when facing life and death always choose life um, and the prophet muhammad taught us that even if the last hour is upon you sow your seed uh, my my teacher roger scruton always used to say that the conservative curse is that conservatives can often be i'm not saying you're a conservative nor are you cursed forgive me I just, yeah. he, he used to say that, that, that i might be cursed i'm no, not no, a conservative god, 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 god bless you and <laughs> that's not what i meant i say that he, he say conservatives used to ha have a grumpy disposition that in you know, the kind of nostalgia and then the end of the world is nigh and he says that we can beat ourselves into a negative pessimistic position where the left is always optimistic about the kind of glorious revolution yet to come. And he used to say that the Hegelian position was always an optimistic position. And, and as conservatives, he used to say that conservatives should be optimistic. And the secret in that is for the last 2,500 years, at so many moments, people have written off the West that this is our final hour, whether it's Socrates all the way down to Winston Churchill, there was always a final hour. And, and that's the difference between us and the Chinese, that we have a self-critical bent of mind, that we can course correct, that you and I can sit here in Washington, D.C., be self-critical openly, and we can course correct in a way that we can't do this in China, and therefore there's no course correction. And therefore I have hope that we will prevail, mm. our side will win. Yes, we will have the niggling problems on the margins with Islamists and far left and the far right, but overall we will win. And the Abraham Accords show us that Jews and Muslims, Arabs and Christians can not only live side by side, but they can trade. When I left the, 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 the when I left Israel after the October 7th attack, um, uh, a dear friend of mine from the United Arab Emirates helped us fly out to Abu Dhabi. That flight to Abu Dhabi and other flights to Dubai were full, despite the October 7th attacks. And those flights 
to Dubai and Abu Dhabi out of... Uh, direct from Israel. Israel. Direct from Tel Aviv are still full. So that's the secret, that if we get away from the loud noise of the, the Islamists and the haters, what you then see is people left alone uh, are trading. There's, I'm uh, assuming you mean full with Israelis, not yes, full it's, with... It, uh, oh, no, no, Israelis. Israelis, you know, Israelis, you know, 20% of whom are mm. Arabs and Muslims. But yes, Israelis are still flying mm. uh, to Dubai and to Abu Dhabi. Um, and and it's got to be said that they're flying over Saudi airspace. And that's why Saudi Arabia deserves credit for supporting the Abraham Accords um, and for having their own conversation for their own kind of unilateral accords. I mean, I think there's something to be said about the, the, the importance of that energy coming out of the Middle East now, led by both the, both the, the leaders in the UAE and in Saudi Arabia. And I think that, that, that to corner, isolate, suffocate and annihilate the Islamist threat, we need those countries behind us. Yeah. Because then the average Muslim says, all oh, right, this is Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Riyadh, Mecca, Medina, you know, and not just London and not just uh, Downing Street. And I think that's the way in which we can isolate the threat and allow for, you know, Britishness and uh, its leadership over the Western world, at least in intellectual terms, to thrive again. What nation is not complicated? Certainly Saudi Arabia, but but if you think from 2003, when they had two Al-Qaeda bomb attacks, they've actually been leading the way from within the Muslim world and de-radicalization. The Emiratis have been, again, there's problems there. I'm certainly not, I do not like the idea of Sheikh Mansour owning a British newspaper. I don't think any head of state should own a media company in Britain. But aside from that, they've been fantastic at uh, normalizing relations you with... want to disclose your personal <laughs> on that issue <laughs> i don't care who owns it as long as it's british um uh, uh well certainly give, not the head of state of another you can give, you can give sheikh mansour a british citizenship i'm sure i'm sure he's <laughs> not sure he okay, yeah. just a city <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um uh but um as, so as it's great to identify these nations that are clearly allies or can be allies but I think there's also an axis of evil that it should be identified, or I call it an axis of evil. I'm sure that's not what it is. It's not very diplomatic with me, but I would say that Qatar, Iran, Hezbollah, the Houthis, Hamas form the opposite of that. And they are enemies of those other Gulf states that I've previously identified as, uh, as Western allies, and of course, the West. I bring this up because the Biden and preceding the Obama foreign policy attitude was directed towards brokering peace with Iran, the famous Iran deal. Oh, brokering peace is probably the wrong way of phrasing it specifically, exactly, but it was certainly Iran-centric. What's your take on that? Do you, do you have a position things should be addressed? Is Biden getting things wrong in this current conflict that you think should be dealt with done differently to, to talk in policy terms um, the American government has stood by Israel at its most difficult moment um, but our friends in Arab countries feel that America has not stood by them at their difficult moment and I think that double standard in how we treat our allies uh, beggars belief so when the Houthis attacked Abu Dhabi airport and the Houthis attacked um, parts of Saudi Arabia, uh, there wasn't a strong enough American response to protect our allies. And when the Houthi pirates attack commercial freights in the Bab al and the uh, Arabian Gulf waters, again, we don't see an American response to either Iranian or Houthi uh, acts of terrorism in the seas or on land and that double standard I think ought to be corrected Israel is an ally our Gulf Ar Arab allies are also allies partners who without whom by the way we would not have won the war on terror without whom we would not have defeated Islamism in the Middle East without whom you know our stock markets and our you know, private equity investments wouldn't be thriving in the West. I mean, I can go on and on about why they're important, but I think it's important to be, yes, loyal to Israel, but also loyal and supportive of our other friends in the Middle East, without whom we are not 
the great nations that we are. Ed Hussein, it's been a pleasure speaking with you, and um, I hope we can continue the conversations. There's more things I hoped we had. Uh, I was hoping to ask you, um, and uh, I think it's also important to note that I think that Jews, Christians, and Muslims. One of the things I love is that they all put God above them, and I think that is our common ground. And I think in this conversation we attempted to find some of that common ground because both of us want. A prosperous and thriving indeed future indeed because we're to live indeed. together and um, so thank you for taking the time to speak with me it's been a great pleasure and and honor really the honor is mine thank you for coming across the ocean thank you for your time thank you for what you do congratulations on your new show oh, you do. and god bless you thank you god bless you thank you so much Ed. thank you winston thank you for watching the winston marshall show if you enjoyed that episode, well, I encourage you to like, share, and subscribe. You can also find us on all podcast outlets if you want just the audio. And of course, on winstonmarshall.co.uk. Thanks for listening.